Okay, so um, I was asked to say a little bit about my father who donated money to help fund this series of lectures. Um, my father, Charles O, came to the United States alone in 1961 at the age of 24 to pursue a PhD in economics at uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. The next time he was able to return home with a wife and three children was 11 years later. Another 10 years would pass before he was able to return a second time. He was born in Taiwan when it was part of Japan. He remembers fleeing to the mountains for shelter from American bombers as a child during World War II. My grandfather was a grocery store owner. Uh, when my father was five, he was sent out on the street to sell fruit. He was supposed to take over the family store and went to a commercial junior high and high school in preparation for that. But when his older brother got into the best university in Taiwan, he decided to study the necessary material for the entrance ex exam on his own and got in. By accident, um, a friend filled in the application form incorrectly. He ended up majoring in economics. <laughs> <laughs> Um, after graduation, he paid most of his sal month monthly salary to an Englishman to learn English in order to take the exam to come to the United States for study. After receiving his PhD, he worked as, an, as a professor at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, that's where I was born, um, the University of Dayton and Queens College in Charlotte, North Carolina. But as I understand it, he realized that it would be difficult to support his family on a professor's salary and went to work for the Small Business Administration in Washington, D.C., where he worked until he retired uh, at the age of 70. I've only known my father for 54 of his 86 years, but to me, there are three phrases that say a lot about him. They are, it's so interesting. <laughs> Second, it's so funny. And last, go on. <laughs> The first two are similar. What they tell me is that my dad is a person who takes excitement and delight in discovering things about the world and in sharing them with others. The last is what I often hear when I make a statement that he's not convinced by. It means that he's politely waiting for, to see how the argument will take shape, but with skepticism. In other words, he has his own views, but is always open to changing them with convincing evidence. My father is an optimistic, honest, curious man who started from humble beginnings and who, through serendipity, hard work, and frugality, saved enough to give back to, back, give back to a system and a country which he feels gave a lot to him. To honor women's achievements in science, he thought it would be inspiring to fund Scripps alumni who had majored in STEM fields to return and share their discoveries and accomplishments. I hope that these lectures will make him say, it's so interesting, or it's so funny, or even, go on. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, we bring you Sarah Balderston. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for, happen uh, for having me and thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about my professional development as well as the contents, the primary contents of my PhD research, which can be encapsulated pretty um, broadly by this title, which is Making Smarter Molecular Scissors Via Engineering Conditional CRISPR Systems. And um, thank you again for the kind introduction. Um, before we dive into that matter at hand, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about myself. So um, I feel like people tend to talk about professional development on a very kind of linear uh, path where there's not a lot of twists and turns or deviations from whatever the stated goal is. Um, but I found from like personal experience and also the experience of a lot of people who I work with that that doesn't usually tend to actually be true. Um, and so, I, like a lot of you, I started off in 2018, graduated from Scripps College, and like um, that was said, I majored in biology and studied abroad in um, Argentina, which like allowed me to do a, a minor in Hispanic studies, which was really exciting. Um, and after college, I didn't really know what I was doing, so I moved back in with my parents. I uh, was applying for jobs and I was really uncertain about what I was going to do next and then all of a sudden I got a call from my uh, one of my ad previous advisors for my thesis 
um, at Scripps, and she told me she had the funding to hire me as a research assistant, and so I moved back to Claremont and worked in KGI, at KGI in the, doc, in the lab of Dr. Kiana Aran. And this is where I first really had exposure to uh, CRISPR as a technology and also um, bioengineering as a field. Um, and so this was a very formative experience. And I was lucky enough to work on a project that ended up being uh, published and became a uh, small startup company out of this publication. And so then I transitioned again and started working in biotech, the biotech industry at a company called Cardea Bio, which is based out of San Diego. Um, it's now part of Paragraph, which is a much larger company. Um, by large, I think it's maybe 50 people. Um, <laughs> but uh, they work on uh, engineering the same type of biosensors that I had uh, worked with in uh, the lab of Dr. Kiana Ron. And, uh, this was also a really formative experience for me. I got to learn a lot about, you know, what I was interested in, um, my skills, what I probably should work on, and that was a really useful experience, but I kept hitting the ceiling after a while of um, not being considered for roles that I felt like I was qualified for or felt like I wanted um, because I didn't have a PhD. And that seems to be kind of a requirement for entry for a lot of these positions. And so uh, on top of that, I also kind of started to be a little frustrated um, with the, the scope of the questions that I was allowed to ask as a scientist working um, in a, a startup company. I think the, you know, they, they're very focused on one thing, which is you know, developing a technology where I was kind of interested in these like broader uh, scientific questions. So that's the, you know, the combination of those two things is what really led me to apply to school. Um, again, and so that's what led me, uh, luckily, to Caltech um, just down the road, which was, uh, this has been one of the highlights of uh, my life is being a student at Caltech. And um, then it wasn't until last year, finally, where I joined my lab where I'm now doing my dissertation work in the lab of Dr. Niles Pierce um, in the bioengineering department. And so, yeah, we can talk about this more later, but that's me. But back to the topic at hand. Aha, okay. <laughs> so before I'm talking about CRISPR and saying all these words, but uh, what does that even mean? Um, before I get into that, I wanna provide you with just a brief history of what it is I'm talking about. So it, back in the 1980s, uh, scientists first discovered these uh, short clustered um, regularly interspaced is what this uh, repeat sequences in the bacteria uh, genome, um, specifically E. coli. Um, and it wasn't until 2005 that it was discovered that there was a protein that was related to these sequences. And then again, it wasn't until five years later in 2010 that this system was described as having a useful role. Um, in the genome uh, of bacteria, and it turned out it was an actual immune response that, uh, that bacteria had developed against uh, viruses that would infect them. And so this is what we like to call the early years, um, that where you know, just biological discovery of what uh, bacteria had evolved to protect themselves. Um, and then in 2012, the very famous paper was published, um, which actually was the first time where people had actually used the system CRISPR-Cas9 to edit genes in the, in the genome of bacteria. And then later, this was also done in mammalian cells. And then all of a sudden, the floodgates open, and we have all these kind of clinical applications. There was treatment, uh, clinical trials for HIV. Uh, very controversially, there was editing in human embryos. Um, there were more clinical trials, immunotherapy, a uh, Nobel Prize was given out um, to another very famous, <laughs> a very famous alumni of Pomona College, um, and more clinical trials to try and cure a lot of blood disorders, and then even more recently, the first ever uh, clinical therapy, which is hoping to cure sickle cell disease, was approved in the United Kingdom. So what actually does this look like mechanistically? Um, so I would like everybody to please participate in an exercise with me. Um, if we, you can all imagine yourselves as a small bacterium living in the gut of some much larger organism. So this is you, one of your cells. 
and all of us, you're just living your life, having a lovely time, and all of a sudden, a really obnoxious thing happens where a, a virus shows up and inserts their uh, genome into you in the hopes of replicating and uh, eventually killing you, and you don't want this to happen, and you don't know how to deal with it at the moment, but if this ever happens again and you survive this infection, you would like to be able to uh, defend yourself. So what you do is you actually take a small piece of the viral genome and you insert it into your own genome. And then so when you, uh, through the process of transcription, which is making RNA, you will then express what we call uh, this CRISPR array, which is interspaced, you'll see, as these repeat sequences in black. And once that's ex expressed and cut with alongside our Cas9 protein and other small RNA, you form these CRISPR complexes, which are specific to particular viral genes that have been previously, uh, you've been previously exposed to. And so, in the event that another annoying uh, virus shows up and tries to do the same thing, you can actually uh, specifically target the genes of that uh, virus and then cut them, which produces a, a very toxic double-stranded break and hopefully will prevent the infection from going forward. So now we're no longer bacteria, we are now scientists. Um, and uh, we, instead of using this tool as a way to protect ourselves from the bacteria-specific viruses, uh, we now simply want to uh, program these molecules to uh, target any particular gene that we're, of in we're interested in. This could be something that's relevant to human health, agriculture. Uh, there's just a, a huge array of things that people can do with this, and that's just because it's so easy to program. Um, this is definitely a step up from what existed prior. If people wanted to do this type of very targeted editing, it took a lot longer, uh, a lot more resources. It was very expensive. It really wasn't very feasible to do it on a large scale. So um, this is all exciting, um, but when I, uh, one of the reasons why I got to the Pierce Lab, why I was so excited, is because they kind of saw this problem with CRISPR. Not that it's not really great, but that you uh, had a lot of control over the target of what you wanted to edit, but not a lot of control over the scope of what you were editing. So um, this looks like, basically, if you look at this logic diagram, um, I apologize because this now gets a little bit more technical, um, that uh, in the, in, when you have your protein, Cas9, and your guide RNA that's functioning, whatever uh, effect you wanna have on your target gene, um, it, it's always gonna happen, this is always on. And what this looks like mechanistically is you have a guide RNA and you have a protein and a target and when all those things are combined, you always have editing. But what we envisioned in the lab, or sorry, what uh, the predecessors of mine in the Pierce lab envisioned was a kind of molecular switches that where you could turn the activity of this complex on and off depending on the present of some new third component which is our programmable RNA trigger X. And so we're just gonna focus on the top green one because um, I don't wanna take up too much of your time. And so <laughs> in this case, uh, we have uh, a, a, a light switch that's always on. You walk into the room and it's on um, however, in the presence of this nice little RNA trigger, um, it will turn off. And so this is kind of what this will look like more mechanistically. So uh, in, the, in this case, what we've done is they've engineered uh, these uh, alternative guide RNAs, which are conditional, so they're called CG RNAs. It's very creative. And <laughs> that's the one thing about science is there's always really fun acronyms. Um, and so what we have is we still have our gene targeting region in blue, or sorry, in orange. But what we've done is that we've extended this region um, using these uh, algorithms which solve for the secondary structures of RNA and DNA uh, to design a region which is complementary to our RNA trigger. So when the RNA trigger is present, it will a uh, complementary base pair with the blue region of our cgRNA, and it will produce a, a now a construct which will no longer interact with our protein and therefore effectively turn it off. 
So I'm not going to go into a ton of the data for the sake of time, uh, but you know, if anyone has any questions, we can come back to this slide and talk about it. Um, what I am going to do is talk about kind of what the next steps are and what it is that I'm specifically doing as a researcher um, in the Pierce Lab because what I've talked about up until this point has already been published and is a very robust, kind of nice to use system. And so what we see as uh, an issue that's still at present is that right now our RNA triggers that we use are uh, very short and synthetic sequences. But what we want to do is we want to engineer a system where our triggers are actually native RNAs and are specific to a particular tissue or cell type. And so I'm going to use the very salient example of cancer. Um, and so you can see a situation where you only want your therapeutic uh, target to be affected in a, uh, in a cancerous cell. You don't want it to affect your, any of the healthy tissue surrounding it. Um, and so this can be done by instead of using a short synthetic RNA trigger, trying to engineer a system that will be responsive to a mRNA trigger, which is specific to a healthy tissue. Um, one perhaps that has been knocked out during the genetic uh, 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 change that happens in cancerous tissue. And so in the case of this example where you have a cancer, where your cgRNA comes into contact with a cancerous tissue, your therapeutic uh, our target of your CRISPR complex will be active. And then uh, in the presence of healthy tissue, it will come into contact with this mRNA trigger, which uh, will effectively turn it off. And so this way we can have a more precise uh, a more precise technology that won't allow a, um, any kind of on target but off tissue effects that could be um, detrimental to kind of the health and safety of the person receiving whatever treatment. So with that, I wanted to say thank you. And I would like to first uh, definitely acknowledge the uh, Pierce Lab members past and present who've enabled a lot of this work and my funding sources, as well as my host institution, and scripts for having me and all the organizers of this event. So, yeah, thank you. You know, my background is in mathematics, and so when I see this uh, conditional logic, um, immediately I think, how, how sophisticated can you make the logic, mm -hmm. right? You know, right now it's, it's you know, if this, you know, then turn it on, right? It, can you have, is it possible to have something like if this and this? Um, for example, instead of, so from what I uh, understand about your work, what you're doing is you're making it so that um, it will, uh, uh, it will turn on when it, when it is, uh, when it notices a, a longer sequence, right? And that's, that's the key, that the, the sequence is longer. Um, and so, you can you can make it more make the action more precise, right? Um, so I was thinking, you know, is would it is there something that stops you from um, uh, rather making a, a sequence of of conditions uh, conditioned on shorter parts of that long sequence rather than trying to train it on a long sequence, saying first look for this. And then if, in addition, this, the second part of the sequence is there, or, then, or maybe the third, then, then turn on. Is, is, that, is that not possible? Tell me why that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's not not possible. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's actually what you're saying is kind of the very, the, what the area of research that we're, we're conducting currently. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I mean, to answer the first part of your question, uh, as it exists currently, we only have this very kind of simple logic, you right, know, right. where we've added a, an on and off switch. Right. Um, and there's, you know, different mechanisms that can achieve that. You know, this is just an example of one that I've shown here, um, one that I've kind of used the most uh, frequently in the lab. Uh, but I think that it is actually, not only is it like kind of, uh, we want to have, target a shorter sequence of a larger sequence as, a, as our trigger. Um, it's kind of required for the mechanism that we're using because um, when you get into this kind of like design parameters, it always looks really clean and tidy when you're looking at it 
as far as the logic diagrams are concerned. Um, but when you get into the lab, you start to realize that all of your other components also have requirements for activities. So like your protein has to still be able to hold on to the RNA that you're changing. Um, and the, you know, the, the different parameters, the scientific parameters that, you know, that have to be satisfied uh, in order for the desired function to happen. Um, but yeah, there is definitely, that's, that is kind of a side project of mm -hmm. trying to add on an additional layer right, of, of right. logic where you could envision kind of another component that would make your RNA trigger available for binding um, later. So in that way you can have like an additional layer of, mm -hmm. of precision. But um, those things are, are still challenging at the moment, I think. Um, I, I, I'm trying not to be too technical, <laughs> but they can be uh, a, li a bit challenging because uh, concentration becomes an issue. You start to, you know, as you add more and more components into a system, right. their uh, potency can dilute oh, over time. So, um, you know, it's, it's a balance. Like, I think, I think we've found a, a system where uh, it can still be really potent and um, more complex than what has already existed, you know, in cells. But um, yeah, it's definitely it's a delicate balance between those two things. Like if you add another component, you have to make sure that you know your whole system doesn't break. If that makes sense. You're right. Mm -hmm. No, no, I understand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I have another question. Uh, okay. <laughs> so my second question is is a little bit more mundane. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, the new pack algorithm that you that you mentioned uh, that's used to 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 design the um, the cgRNA and uh, the, the pairs basically mm -hmm. um, yeah so um, for people who aren't uh, as familiar so um, my I'll kind of start at the beginning a little bit so my current advisor Niles Pierce um, who's at Caltech he is actually a mathematician by trade and he somehow became a very you know predominant figure in the field of bioengineering, which I just find really fascinating. Um, but he set out you know in the beginning of his career to try and solve an issue that he saw biology having as being not you know predictable and not very easily quantified the way that um, kind of mathematics and chemistry and physics and other kind of STEM fields are. And so this really frustrated him about it. And so he set out to design an actual algorithm that would predict um, reliably the, the way in which RNA and DNA uh, will bind to itself and bind to other molecules. And so this, you know, and this is actually, you can think of it as being like sort of simple because RNA and DNA, they only, each of them, they only have four base pairs and there's very specific rules about which ones can bind to which other ones. And so this, you know, it seems like maybe it might be a kind of straightforward thing to solve, but once you get to like longer and longer sequences, the, it, it, it kind of, it breaks the whole thing. It takes, you know, the, the computation takes forever and all this stuff. So, um, but so, you know, I think after maybe 10 years of research, they ended up with NewPack, which is this, you can actually go online now and uh, chuck in a sequence uh, and it'll spit out what, uh, what structure it will have. Um, actually, I should have, you know, but anyway, you can do it on your own time if you're interested. But I, I, I will. I will. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So this is this tool that we now have where we can analyze, uh, you know, uh, molecules that we're interested in. We can uh, design, you know, which is how we got cgRNAs, where we can design these like interacting strands. Um, and so yeah, it's it's a really it's a really useful tool. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I believe it's still open access. Maybe check sooner rather than later before they make people start paying for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is what, so earlier we were talking and, and Sarah mentioned that there's been a trend in biology to, to make biology more, more math. And this is, this is what you're talking about basically, that you're, you're instead of, you're, you're having sort of, you're almost creating like um, a number system where you say this plus this will be this for, for biology? Is that, am I understanding that? Yeah, I, I think a little bit. I think um, when I 
I, this is, I think, a principle that has now been drilled into me a little bit more at Caltech. I think they, as a, as a biology department, bioengineering department, have, have really focused on trying to, uh, have tr trying to focus on the, the more quantitative aspects of biology rather than the qualitative. I think for almost all of the history of the field of biology, um, it's been very qualitative. It started off as, you know, just people being observational and saying, you know, this bird has a larger beak than that bird, and why did that happen? Um, but, and, you know, and as time goes on, you start to have, like, you know, you look at a, a gel, like DNA in a gel, and you say, this band is, you know, 50% darker than this band, and so we can make some sort of broad conclusion based off of that. Um, but if you think about the actual numbers that you're interpreting in those situations, they're pretty qualitative, right? They're, we've, you know, a, a kind of arbitrary, or not arbitrarily, but we've assigned number systems to them. Um, whereas the field has gotten to a point now where we have a technology where we can do like sequencing of individual cells. We can image individual molecules and actually count you know, the numbers of actual, uh, actual biomolecules that are uh, interacting in a particular process. And so that has enabled much more um, kind of quantitative uh, analysis. And so then uh, the kind of, the next step to that is like, okay, well, like we wanna model this and predict what can happen. And so this is kind of, with NUPAC, I think focusing on, on RNA and DNA first is, is definitely was very uh, appealing to my my advisor who's a mathematician and so um yeah and he also i think he kind of strategically chose rna dna as the first attempt because of how kind of simple it is in principle um and people are kind of trying to do the same thing with with proteins but um you know instead of having four nucleotides you have 21 amino acids for proteins and so mm -hmm. you can see the how like that would become a, a much more complex problem mm -hmm. do you know if if they're if that's the next step for him or if if they're planning to not for no not for him mm -hmm. but uh i mean i don't know i i could ask him <laughs> that's not that's not i don't think that that's his his goal i think he's really focused on the field of like rna and nanotechnology mm -hmm. um but that is definitely the next step for you know the field in general mm -hmm. um there's already some uh predictive algorithms that work okay with proteins that you know are pretty reliable um, but there's there's still a long way to go as far as like being able to you know predict their their structures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if anyone's interested in that it's called alpha fold <laughs> okay. okay yeah so um, um, so it sounds like the step is basically like previously when you're looking at intensity, that intensity is sort of like an it's sort of like an average, like a summary of of many many things. And mm -hmm. so what you're getting now is may, maybe like a greater resolution, like much much mm -hmm. finer resolution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because um, I think if if anyone here has taken any kind of intro bio, you've probably run like a electrophoresis gel or things like that, where you are just putting, you know, the actual process of it is you're just putting the whole volume of your small tiny vial of clear liquids into a, a gel and just applying, um, you know, electricity to that gel to watch these charged molecules migrate across this um, this medium and then they'll hopefully separate, you know, in a, in a predictable fashion, and then you can just uh, basically, like, look at the band and say, okay, that's, like, pretty dark. <laughs> this one, I can't see it at all. The other one is, like, you know, there, but it's pretty light, and, and then make some sort of assumption based off of, of what happened, you know, in your, in your small, on your small vial, on your, on your lab band, on your lab bench. Um, but that, Obviously, you know, you're missing a lot of information in that example. Um, you know, it's, it's gotten biology really far. You know, like we've, we've discovered a lot using these, this, these kind of more uh, higher, like, or, you know, lower resolution technologies right. where we're, we're looking at like total 
uh, you know, RNA or total protein content, whatever it is. Um, but I think we've now reached a point where, yeah, we have more uh, of the tools to, yeah, like you said, and increase the resolution of what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's real, I, it sounds re revolutionary, right? So, <laughs> right, that's, presumably this is, I mean, this, it sounds like uh, this has caused a great revolution in, in biology, or? I sorry, think, sorry to ask such, <laughs> such naive, I, naive I, questions. I, I think it's getting, I think it's getting there. No, I, I, it's, it's good. I think um, it's, it's, it's just starting, uh -huh. I think, I want to say, um, when I, I, you know, kind of on a more personal level, when I showed up to Caltech as a first year grad student, I had done zero computation, mm -hmm. you know, before that. I think I had like maybe looked at one page of code before. Um, and when I got there, I, I kind of naively was like, oh yeah, I'll just like, I can just teach myself these things. And um, it, it was a, a struggle and all of a sudden though, like I think being kind of more uh, able to use these tools more easily enables a lot more kind of information that you can obtain from the stuff that you're looking at. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think that it is kind of maybe a little specific to the program that I selected. I think the institution that I'm at is, is very much kind of, uh, yeah, quantitative in nature, like they want everybody, like people at Caltech are very obsessed with numbers and so um, they they want to kind as, of. As they should be. Yeah, exactly, yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think it, I, it took us a little convincing for me. I was kind of annoyed that I had to learn all the, <laughs> all of these tools, but now that I kind of am more uh, familiar with them, I, I'm, I'm starting to see their value, so. So you, you're not, it sounds like you're sort of suggesting that everybody should, should uh, do compute do some coding, or maybe you're I not mean, suggesting that. I, I don't I don't want to annoy everybody who showed up here, you know. But I think that uh, it it's something that I definitely overlooked, and I think I think when I was here too, like uh, it it had not yet happened. Like right. th like Python, like all of these language like computer languages, they were not readily available to people. Um, but I, even in the last like five years, you know, you have all these, like you can now just like go on Google and like write a code and do, do all this stuff. So um, I, don't, I don't think that it's required. Um, like I, it definitely wasn't for me, you know, I, I, I learned it once I got into school and, um, you know, learned it as I needed these tools. Um, and there's definitely, you know, fields of biology where where these things are not as applicable. I, I just so happen to choose a field where this is kind of at the forefront. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely really useful. I think um, it's something that can be really handy um, in just to make your life easier in the field of, you know, in STEM, but also like just in your daily life, actually, it's pretty useful. So um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend it if you have the time, like it's, it's not, terribly difficult to just kind of expose yourself to it. There's a lot of great, like, just free online resources. Um, yeah, and if you have the opportunity, like, take a computer science class, because I definitely wish I had when I was here. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have it while, yeah. while you are here. Yeah, I don't even think I had an option to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I could have we gone do, to Harvey Mudd or something. I, right? I teach it. <laughs> <laughs>